Um, I'm wondering if Tiff Bloomley would like to just chime in and say hello and talk about the upcoming session and how you're going to do your very your your freshman session remotely. Well, hi everybody. Um, <clears throat> thanks for inviting me. Um, Gabrielle and I will be um, switching on and off this time. I'll I'll do Ward Six next month. I'll do Ward Five, and she'll be here at Ward Six. Um, and um, uh, so I'm not technically. I'm just a private. Sit I mean, I I haven't been sworn in or anything, so I. You can't really trust a thing that I say. Um, I I do. We just spent three hours today in um, committee. Um, well, it was actually a full session of the General Assembly to go over JFO numbers, um, which were. I mean, some were encouraging, and and you know, many are are kind of um, undecipherable right now. Um, given what we don't know about a uh, future stimulus package, um, given what we don't know about the, what the feds will allow us to spend some of the remaining COVID money on, and um, given what we don't know about um, the pandemic. And, and so, um, you know, I, I, um, we're, we are in orientation sessions about 20 hours a week actually right now uh and <clears throat> it's been really interesting the administration is is sponsoring every single um agency is sponsoring something um so for those of us who are new and there are, i think 34 new members um of the house um you know we've we've got a lot of catching up to do i won't find out uh we won't find out what committee we're on until uh the session starts so um uh, and obviously that's where Gabrielle and I will have the most information, but um, I guess I, you know, so I can't, I, there's, there's very little <clears throat> that I can tell you about what's happening, except that we are indeed meeting remotely um, for probably most of the session. And, um, and I think that's going to be better for the staff at, at, at the state Capitol um, who really have a hard time making that transition um, and would be exposed to all of us if we did a hybrid system um, as they're doing in the schools. So um, I think that, you know, the question that I have and I have asked um, folks at Ward 5 about um, and um, our city councilors about is how is it, um, <clears throat> what do you need from from your legislative representatives? What what kind of information beyond updates from, you know, um, from the legislature as things start rolling out? And but what 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 should we be doing for you, for for the neighborhood planning association? Um, so I have a question before we go to that, which yeah. is, what are the JFO numbers? <clears throat> I'm sorry, the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, oh. Uh, of the state re releases a whole bunch of economic numbers um, and they're not finalized because they, you know, they're in draft form, but indicators basically about um, the rest of this fiscal year and then the following fiscal year. So other steering committee members are welcome to chime in. I will just say that in terms of your role with the NPA, what we have typically done is asked our representatives and um, senators as well to talk to us at the beginning of the session to uh, let us know what their goals are for the session. And then we've often had them come back at the end of the session to report on what has happened, like what legislation happened, you know, hopes, dreams, failures, the whole, the whole range. Um, so that has been pretty much the extent of our requests from our representatives and senators, but feel free other committee members to hop in. I would just like to say um, congratulations. And I know you, uh, you, you had said that you guys are, are going to switch off and come as regularly as you can. And I, th I just want to say, I think that's wonderful, just so you can hear issues that we wouldn't even think to bring up even in 
you know, a quarterly meeting or whatever, or, you know, if you, if you came at the beginning or the end, it's great if, that you're able to come more often, just issues come up that may not be a priority when you're at whatever meeting, but in the interim. So that's all I have to say. I, thank you. Thank you for coming and Sure. Sure. And it's actually one of the benefits of the pandemic is that it was hard for the legislators sometimes to make it back to meetings. They couldn't get back be, in yeah. time. They couldn't get back to yeah. Arlington. Right. Right. And so <clears throat> um, you're just right there. Mm -hmm. So that, that actually means you're more accessible, which is cool. Yeah, I'm not even commuting. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, how any is other, any other thoughts about, I mean, I, it's difficult for me to talk about my, you know, the, the session, um, right this moment, because they're, you know, we're taking in an awful lot. Um, and I don't know what committee I will be assigned to. Uh, and, um, and so I can speak in very general terms, but I, I think that, uh, that next month, both Gabrielle and I will have more to more to say that would be maybe useful to you all. Yeah, so we're gonna shift to Kevin in just a moment, but Tiff, before we say uh, goodbye to this portion, is there anything you can say in a couple of minutes about the orientation process and anything that stands out for you about being onboarded as a new legislator? Um. You know, it's, I think that uh, meeting remotely has one advantage, and that is that we have to work really hard and very deliberately to build relationships with people we don't know. And <clears throat> that's, you know, it's going to, it's going to be challenging for people who are new to, um, to know who to talk to um sometimes to know um who the expert on this is and so the more that we can gabrielle and i and others can use this time to um to talk with um you know some of the committee head chairs and some of the people from the legislative council just so we know kind of how who to, who to turn to um what uh, what's available to us in terms of um help on this or that and and um, and reach across the aisle um, to either the progressives or to the to um, Republicans it, it just got to be very deliberate and that's um, and, and you know we as first years have we kind of coalesced around this and um, uh, started orienting ourselves um, you know decided that we could help one another. Um, do some of this. And there probably are about 30 hours of orientation sessions between the Democratic caucus work and um, and all of the sessions that are being sponsored by the JFO or the, the um, legislative leadership or um, individual administration agencies. And that, I mean, you know, a lot of people have full-time jobs. <clears throat> they can't attend all of them. So we're pinch hitting for one another. And and covering certain things and taking notes and you know slapping in the same Google Drive. I think that that the <clears throat> there's a lot of information we're getting. The biggest hole um, lies in the stuff that you take in, um, not verbally, but just by watching, um, right. by you know walking in a hall. Yeah. And <clears throat> so, if you know what, I'm gonna actually have to cut you off because that's fine. That's yeah, no, thank you for all that information. I think it has got to be a very odd experience to be uh, joining the legislature under these circumstances. It's such a um, an environment that relies on sort of incidental interactions and um, lots and lots of contacts. So yeah, thank you for what you're doing just to gear up. And so next I would like to um, introduce Kevin Pounds. Kevin is the CEO of A New Place and Kevin's currently working on the Champlain Inn project, which is converting that former inn to a temporary low barrier shelter. And um, 
Kevin, because of your project's proximity to our ward, we would love to hear uh, how it's going and what you anticipate for the future. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to share tonight. Um, <clears throat> and also want to say just thank you to a lot of people in the neighborhood have um, really given us a warm welcome as new neighbors. And so I, I know that that's kind of a, you know, as Ari has already been alluded to is like meeting your neighbors looks a little bit different during COVID times than it did six months ago. But I really do appreciate the way um, just uh, different individuals, families, uh, businesses, even uh, Christ the King School down the street have kind of reached out and um, welcomed us. And so some of these are, and some of it's even just personal relationships, people reaching out and, and being very encouraging about what we're doing. Um, kind of what I was thinking, and I, I don't want, I don't want to um, bore everyone with too much of a backstory, but I think uh, there's a lot of questions that come up about like, who is a new place? Where did you guys come from? Um, and, you know, what are you wanting to do at the Champlain Inn? I, I think that that kind of captures a lot of it. Uh, before I start talking, though, I mean, a lot of times when I do a presentation, especially if it's a, a more manageable group like this, I, I, I'll just kind of open it up. Are there any, like, things you want to make sure you're just like, hey, when you're talking about who you are, and wh like, here, what are some front-end questions that you have that I can, I can make sure that I answer and kind of what I'm going to walk through, and then I can do some Q&A at the end, too. But um, I'm not going to answer the question necessarily right now, but I'm just curious. So any, any questions, you're just like, hey, here's some things I'm curious about that I want to make sure you cover as you're talking about a new place in the Champlain Inn. Yeah, I'll, I'll I, say, I thought that summary you said you were going to explain sounded fantastic. That's exactly okay. the kind of questions I was going to ask. Sorry, I interrupted someone. Yeah. I would say dive in, Kevin. Okay, sounds good. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to do share screen, show you, um, take you through a little PowerPoint because I'm a visual person. It helps me kind of think through um, where we've been and where we're going. Um, let's see if I can do this. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, so um, our organization actually goes back to 1982, A New Place Does. In 1982, we actually started as Burlington Emergency Shelter. And it was really kind of birthed when there was a small group of people from local congregations that saw the growing number of people that were experiencing homelessness in Burlington are like, okay, um, our faith kind of informs us to do something about this. And so uh, interestingly enough, and I've met some of these people, actually one of them was volunteering on Sunday, helping us move furniture around. Um, you know, they weren't people from a um, professional nonprofit background or social work background, but they came together, started this nonprofit Burlington Emergency Shelter, raised some money, and they actually bought what was formerly the liquor store on on North Street and reimagined it. And this is kind of ironic to me is, is they reimagined it as a sober shelter. And um, and so really Burlington Emergency Shelter kind of ran like a traditional emergency shelter from 1982 all the way until 2014. And what, what I mean by that is people would come in, they'd get a meal, you know, at 6 p.m. Um, after they'd eat, they'd get a bunk, they'd spend the night, wake up in the morning, get a cup of coffee, hit the streets about 8 a.m., 6 p.m., they could check back in for a bunk and repeat. And, and I think, you know, what happened over time is that, and, and even before Cohen went on staff, I was involved as a volunteer with the organization, so I can speak to this from a volunteer perspective, is even though we, we definitely valued the idea and the importance of providing somebody safe, warm shelter, you know, and, and, a, and something to eat each night, there's also the sense of frustration of seeing people just cycling in and out, right? You know, you'd see somebody there for six months, they'd be out for a year, they would come right back, you know? And, and I think for, I think a lot of people that are involved in homeless services for any amount of time, there's always a sense of frustration when you see people kind of caught in that cycle and not really, um, phrase we use a lot, a lot within a new place is charting a path forward. And so in 2014, uh, the organization, and I think some people on the exterior thought it was just like a rebrand, but it, it was really much more than that. It was like going under the hood 
is saying, how can we make changes as an organization to really um, enable people or to well equip people with the tools to escape the cycle of homelessness? And so what happened in 2014, even though it's still based at 89 North Street, um, some changes that were made pretty instantly were, okay, let's, let's start, um, start organizing around individualized case management. Let's start creating an intentional transitional housing program that's helping people find long-term housing and providing aftercare support and things like that. And so uh, I'll just say this, you know, my involvement in the last few years as executive director is I inherited some of this program but I think once we made that shift away from just being a traditional emergency shelter, it's probably not um, by any accident that we saw a lot more people um, maintaining sobriety. We saw a lot more people reconnecting with their families and healthy relationships. We saw a lot more people moving into long-term housing and actually sustaining that housing. And, um, and, and so we actually really moved away from that kind of emergency shelter model into um, what I think most people would call more of a transitional housing program. Um, something that really changed for us was in last fall, it was uh, right after Labor Day 2019, um, the city and community health centers of Burlington approached us about taking over running um, the city's low barrier shelter. And kind of what, it, what had happened with that is uh, I think if you go back to like, I think maybe 2014, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, because there was just this need for like a low barrier winter shelter, it started it. Um, they ran it for about a year. They gave it to Cots. Cots ran it for about a year. Champlain, uh, excuse me, C Community Health Centers of Burlington tried taking it on for three years. And, um, and I think in all fairness, what was happening is, is it is a difficult, I mean, it has been historically a difficult thing to run. And so this, this a winter low barrier shelter was getting passed around kind of like a hot potato from one organization to another. Cause um, you know, I think, a, I don't wanna speak for the other organizations but I think just a lot of people were experiencing staff burnout. Um, there wasn't really, there's a lot of questions about how to make it sustainable. And so we thought about it for about one week because it was there was about seven weeks to get it up and running and decided we should take, um, well, more than we should take a stab at it is we thought, okay, if we could just get one winter under our belts and kind of get a feel for like what this thing is and what it could be and should be, maybe it's something we could, we could um, make more sustainable. And it's also something that, uh, yeah, we're thinking, how can we make it sustainable? How can we find a better location for it? How can um, we turn it into something that's year round and not just from November 1st to April 30th? And hopefully along the way, um, start dripping into some, some real, some onsite services. And so kind of what happened is we took that on. <clears throat> um, that was, and we were able to open it on ramp staff between beginning of September, we on ramp staff, put the systems in place and somehow I mean semi miraculous got the funding in place in about seven weeks to, to get it up and running and um, and you know I, I'd say by all marks it, things were going pretty smooth we were running it out of the basement at 179 South Winooski and then something unexpected to all of us happened um, COVID hit and that was March and so end of March comes along we realized that uh, 179 South Winooski, the basement there is not going to work, um, especially during COVID. It was already a less than optimal space. And so once COVID started hitting Burlington, we realized we were going to have to shut down that space because if one person became sick, it was, we were going to have all of our staff and guests sick. And there was just no way that we could follow any CDC guidelines. And what happened over- So Kevin, over the, I just want to interrupt for a sec and yeah. let you know you have 10 more minutes and that includes questions. So. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and so what's happened over the course of this, uh, the last few months is in um, end of March, we ended up moving it to North Beach Campground and Campers. Uh, then at the end of the end of May, um, just because of some resource challenges, and this was with the help of the state and city, we did this, we ran a sanctioned tenting area while we were working on kind of a long-term solution. Uh, through, through a partnership with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, we were able to acquire a gr pretty sizable federal grant. And that's what enabled us to purchase um, the Champlain Inn. And so 
We're renovating that right now, as some of you can probably see by all the Wright and Morrissey trucks out in front of the Champlain Inn. And we're going to be reopening it on Monday as a 34 unit, um, 50 bed, uh, low barrier temporary housing facility. And so, um, like, it, like I said, there'll be 34 semi-private units, 50 beds and, um, and on-site services there. And so that, that's, that's in a nutshell what we're doing. Uh, when we open on Monday, we won't be opening all 50 beds because there's still some renovations going on on two floors. So we're gonna be opening it with 30 beds on Monday and within the next two weeks after, get up to that 50 bed mark. So I'll stop there and, and provide some time for questions. Great, thank you. I'll jump in with a question if I can. Sure, go ahead, Andy. Great. First of all, thanks for the presentation. Thank you guys for taking on the work and um, I really support the idea of trying to reinvent systems to meet people's needs better and hopefully break the cycle. So I really like uh, what you shared with us. A um, couple questions. I, I live um, pretty close by here to the Champlain Inn. I'm curious about what the staffing will be. Uh, I'm also curious about how people um, get referred. So um, if you could just say a little bit about, about that and sort of what the programming or approach or uh, services on site are gonna be. Yeah. So um, first question about staffing is, so anytime we have clients or guests on site, we have staff on site. And so we run minimally two people per shift or two people, there's always two staff on site 24 seven. Yeah, um, during, during daytime hours and early evening hours, it's usually three. During kind of the middle of the night when people are sleeping, it's two. But, uh, but we always have a minimum of two on site. Uh, as far as referrals go, um, it's, I'd say it kind of comes from three lanes. One is just self-referrals. It's somebody just coming in off the street. They've heard that we have, you know, a low barrier shelter facility and, you know, they knock on the door or they, they call and they say, hey, do you have a bed? Uh, second one would be economic services. A lot of people that are, that know they're on the verge of becoming homeless will reach out to economic services and they'll, re we have a really close to a relationship and they'll refer people directly to us. And the third source is just other agencies in town. I mean, it could be um, anybody from like, you know, Howard Center to Cots to, you know, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, they, they all have a direct line to us. And so they have the ability to make direct referrals. And so I, I it doesn't always break down this way, but I, I would get, you know, guesstimate based on past experience, about two thirds of the guests we have are actually referrals from either economic services or, or other agencies in town. Um, and, and, and that helps too, because it makes, if we get a referral from an, through another agency, it means at least they've had a first touch of saying yes to services. And it makes it a little bit easier to connect people to, to services too, which is often a key to them um, escape, escaping that cycle. Um, as far as on-site services, it, it, it um, I mean, a lot of, some of this is formal, some of it is informal. I mean, our staff, even our staff that aren't formal case managers, they really do like view things through the lens of like, how do we, you know, engage people that may even be service averse relationally and start moving them, them in that direction. And so uh, we, we kind of have two, two layers to case management. We have what, one person who we call our triage case manager. And that's just what it sounds like, you know, kind of like you go to the emergency room and they're trying to figure out like, okay, Let's, let's patch this person up and then figure out where, which way they could go. And really Nick, our triage case manager, when he's good doing case management, people don't even know they're getting case management. Like they don't know they're actually on his caseload. He's just, you know, walking around the parking lot, you know, chatting with them about life and kind of encouraging them in a direction. Um, for people that are, have a little bit more forward motion, um, we connect them with what we call one of our charter new path case managers. And that's, that's a little bit more, that's, that's definitely like, let's sit down, let's talk about, you know, what your story is, what barriers you're facing, and let's like start putting together a game plan of like, of, of, of what some of your goals are and figure out how we can get you moving forward on that. Um, that's and, great. Um, yeah. Kevin, we have five minutes left. I just want to see if there are any other folks who have questions. Yes, Mark. Um, I question and comment. 
Um, I do a lot of federal criminal defense, and I know that there's the um, <clears throat> residential treatment field is underserved dramatically. Um, and also the, the group of individuals that go through residential treatment at a place like Valley Vista, but then need a sober housing type facility while they are working, let's say on conditions of release or whatever. Now, I know that US Attorney Christina Nolan is very, very much supportive of this idea. I would urge you to reach out to her office, the US Attorney's Office, but also to the United States Probation Office, which is the wing of the federal court, since they're often placing people or recommending whether or not people should be placed on conditions of release, for example, in a place such as yours. Their standards are quite rigorous, and, um, but, and so it's really great. I mean, it could be a huge collaboration for you. So I applaud what you're doing. Thanks, Mark. Becky, did you have your hand up? No, I was just trying to get your chance. Helping me out. <laughs> okay. Is there anyone else? Matt? Yeah, I just, uh, thank you, Kevin, for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, maybe this is a dumb question, but uh, how do you how do you feel this helps to uh, meet uh, present demand? Is it like 20% of the demand you may anticipate, or is the demand inexhaustible? I just wonder what your what your knowledge is about that. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I, I when you said that, I was going to pull up a stat that came in today. Um, was it we just had we have our monthly meeting with the Chittenden Homeless Alliance this morning. And I think this probably tells, gives you a good snapshot is um, as of today, there are 568 room hotel rooms being rented in Chittenden County to house people that are experiencing homelessness. And so, and that's not really a sustainable approach. It was, it was, it's just like kind of where things are right now. Um, just as things have been, uh, we'll just say amplified by the COVID crisis. And so, I think that that kind of speaks for itself about why we kind of felt the pressing need to get this place open quickly, um, because they're you know they're um, th we know the motels aren't aren't from a financial perspective sustainable for the state, and um, there's really not the ability in those kind of settings. Even though I know the Champlain Inn is a motel, since we kind of own it, we can create services and and structure around it. I mean, putting 118 people, you know, 118 rooms. Um, at the Holiday Inn, they're, they're just not really designed to, 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 to help homeless people move forward. So I think, I think we kind of feel the pressure a lot to get it going. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right. And then Becky, and we've got two minutes, so. Mary, you're on mute. Yeah, regarding food, um, how do you feed them? Or are you open to food donations, I guess, is my question. And if so, what type of food, if you need that, if you're looking for that now? Yeah, so traditionally in a new place, we've been really open to meal providers. During COVID, it's been a little bit more challenging for sure. And so um, at least th through you know, the present situation, because we're talking about 50 people per night, individually packaged meals, that's really tough for like even individuals and businesses to do. So we um, we have a really close partnership with New Moon Cafe. It was on 150 Cherry Street. And so we actually contract with them to provide all of our meal, all of our dinners each night. And so- That's great. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. And then Becky. I just got a question about families. Um, are, are most of your um, clients individuals or are you do you have families or families with children? Uh, they're all individuals. We um, we point uh, most most of the families right now are are staying in like one specific motel with help from economic services, and then there's a Cots family shelter that, that we refer people to also. Gotcha. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but Kevin, all this is very interesting. Thank you for making time to speak with us this evening. I imagine you're extremely busy with opening on Monday, so we really appreciate your taking time out of your evening to meet with us. Um, yeah, we may want to talk with you some more as this project is implemented and, you know, see how things are going down the road, literally and figuratively. Um, great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. So the next portion of our evening is um, we're going to be talking about COVID-19. Uh, we're looking at it from three perspectives. One from um, 
wastewater monitoring, which is a technology that has been implemented not fairly recently to detect the virus in our sewage, um, which is fascinating and, and kind of gross. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. We're also going to be speaking with someone who does contact tracing for the state. And then we'll speak after that with Tracy Dolan, who's the uh, deputy commissioner of the health department. And she'll let us know what's going on up to date at, at the department. So uh, to start off, we have Megan Moir, and she is going to talk to us about, and I hope I didn't butcher your name, Megan, to talk about wastewater monitoring. Hi, yes, thanks. Let me share my screen here. Find out when it, which of my many windows. Let's see. I think it's that one. Are you guys seeing a slide that, the title slide? Awesome. And my friend over here, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the tardigrade, which is the world's most fascinating animal. I view it as the um, as the patron saint of COVID, it's been blasted off into space, frozen, completely desiccated, and then it comes back to life. And so I think about if the tardigrade can do it, um, then so can we. So thanks for inviting uh, me. I think this is the first time that I've sort of talk, spoken to a group other than to the media about um, our project, which is wastewater-based epidemiology. Um, not so much tracking the concentration so much as the infection trends. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Oh, and I am the division head for water resources. So I oversee your water, wastewater and stormwater services for the city. So a little bit of an introduction. Um, is there anybody here who's heard of wastewater based epidemiology or the fact that, you know, wastewater is basically one of the ways in which we can save ourselves from from COVID? Hopefully you guys have. There's been numerous articles and and, you know, after I sort of emerged from dealing with COVID shutdown and making sure we could still provide water, uh, drinking water and wastewater services to the city 24 seven, which we have been successful in doing even through the, the height of the hard lockdown. Um, you know, I had started seeing some of these um, news articles and I certainly was familiar with wastewater-based epidemiology. I um, can't remember if it was in the early 2000s, we participated with the USGS and actually worked with them to sample our sewage um, so that they could analyze uh, the prevalence of different types of illegal drugs, um, because pretty much anything that you're ingesting, you are in some ways peeing or pooping out, um, and then that can be picked up in the sewage. And so they were able to kind of monitor the different trends of when heroin was coming in and, and then when heroin, if it went away or when the, the, the antidepressants that they saw in the school, maybe population um, would fade away and then you'd see more of the like sort of elderly drugs. So it's very, very interesting. You can think of sewage as a stream, right? And a watershed in which without even looking at whether the stream is for, whether the watershed is forested or is, you know, a big old city, just looking at the water and what's in that waste stream tells you a lot about what's going on on the landscape. So we're not the only ones uh, across the world and, and particularly in Europe. And I know I'm, they're also doing it in South Africa. Um, people are using this mes methodology primarily to try to anticipate and just even get a few days ahead of the virus um, and thereby hopefully stop outbreaks. So some of the key benefits of using wastewater based epidemiology. Um, one of the cool parts, and you can see in this graph here, this is just an example of you're able, to, before you actually start seeing cases reported and people submitting themselves to the PCR testing, you're able to detect this increase um, in the wastewater stream. And what we're looking for is actual um, components of the RNA. It's not the virus itself, but traces of the genes that are related to uh, the virus of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, one of the really cool pieces is that before people start showing symptoms, so when they're in this range here, um, actually I have my cursor over here. When they're in this range here, you're able, they start, they can start shedding um, in their wastewater. So in their fecal matter, not necessarily in their urine. The other cool part is that people who are asymptomatic and remain asymptomatic also continue shedding. So it's a way of um, getting that sort of advance notice, which you can see in this next slide. This is a, a sample from the, the lab that we're working with of a European city in Spain. And you can see that the, um, the concentration of the SAR, of the, the RNA 
kind of remains low here. And then before you actually start to see the cases start showing up in the population, you start to see this uptick, right? So one thing that we have to be really careful on is that I, I can't tell you and the people who are doing this can't correlate exactly a particular concentration with a particular predicted caseload. And that is largely because there's so many different factors. Even looking at the different sewer sheds that we have in, um, in the city, certain sewer sheds are gonna naturally have higher concentrations that may show up for the same maybe number of cases because they are, for instance, primarily residential flows. So like the new North End, there's not a lot of business and commercial and production out there. And so most of the water that's actually getting to North Plant is from residential properties. And that is where people are providing sort of the most contribution. Same thing with one of our sub sewer sheds in main plants, which comes from the old North End. We've seen some of our highest uh, concentrations there. And while that is good to note from a trend standpoint and potentially to deploy additional resources in that area, um, we know that it is primarily residential and doesn't have the same influence that say the Southern sewer shed has, which has a lot of the flows from the breweries and restaurants and so on and so forth. Um, and so things could be a little bit more diluted. You know, the other cool part is that you're able to capture again, this whole sewer shed here um, and all these different, uh, you know, it could be schools, it could be long-term healthcare facilities, it could be residences and you're able to either sample directly at the treatment plant or once, um, and we've done this bit of work, you can kind of break things out into sewer sheds where you have a, a higher level of granularity. As I said, it's really important to note that this is just one piece of an integrated strategy we're, we're not saying that it should take the place of testing or the, or the place of masking and socially distancing. It is just one more imperfect data set with all of the other imperfect data sets that we have. Um, as I said, the concentrations can't be easily converted into predicted case numbers, but what we do look at is the trends. And if any of you saw the graph that the mayor um, published today, which does come from this data, you know, it is showing an increased trend and we'll talk about that in a second. So just simply, how do we measure it? Um, the sampling is coming directly from you know, manholes. Those are the round covers that you see in the street. Um, those are access points to our sewer system. Uh, our wastewater team has have been heroes in this whole thing. They're processing all of your wastewater while also going out and doing the sampling. Um, it's not without its problems. The samplers can get hung up with all of the stuff that people flush, all of the disposable wipes that people um, think are flushable and they aren't, and so on and so forth. We then uh, overnight it to a lab out in Colorado, and then they go through an extraction process and then use PCR to uh, determine the concentration of the RNA. So I'm going to go a little fast through these ones. You know, we there was a lot of background work that happened into coming up with the coming up with the ideal sampling plan for the city. Um, we looked specifically at our sewer network system. We used our hydraulic model, um, and then obviously lots of conversations with my team about figuring out what the right sewer sheds were. We knew that at a minimum, we were gonna be sampling the, the sort of macro sewer sheds for each of the three wastewater treatment plants that we have, North Ave uh, treatment plant, main plant, which is the one on the Burlington waterfront, and then East plant, which is the one on, the, um, on Riverside. Um, but then we further went through and for the, for the sewer sheds that are larger. So this sewer shed here is for North Plant. This one over here is for East Plant and serves sort of the, the university and the hospital. And then this larger one is for Main Plant. Because those are lar larger sewer sheds, we did then break up North Plant into two different ones, um, Main Plant into three, and then East Plant's already small enough. And what was recommended to us by, the, um, by our uh, provider of these services is that when things are kind of low, so let's see, back in October when we started with GoAgua, which is the firm that we're using, we basically were only sampling at the, uh, at the plant level. And their recommendation was to sample frequently there so that you actually had that frequency um, to be able to detect the different trends. And then once you started to see things go up, to start going out into the sewer sheds where you might be able to then determine whether say one sewer shed was hotter than another, and then potentially deploy resources to that sewer shed. Thus far, I think the only time it's sort of worked out, you know, when we had a, a spike in the North Plant sewer shed, resources were deployed to the entire sewer shed and not just necessarily to the one or the other, because we were kind of still learning and figuring out at that point um, how this, this particular plan worked. And looking at the latest data, I think it's, it's really pretty interesting. Um, 
this is just uh, the different um, uh, sort of trends. So there, the colors here are corresponding to the CDC uh, matrix, which looks at concentration times trend. And you can see at the week when we started with uh, Goagua, things were actually looking pretty good, which kind of corresponded to where Burlington was at at that time. There were cases of, of COVID that had been reported, but overall it wasn't too bad. Then as we started to get into the next few weeks, we were starting to see some upticks in main plant in particular that we are monitoring. And then um, North plant began starting to become hot and it kind of progressed. And then now what we're looking at this week, um, which is of somewhat of, I guess, a fair amount of concern um, uh, was a, a great uptick in North plants concentration. So again, it's not just the, the pure absolute value of their concentration that they're looking at, but the fact that it was low and then the graph got really steep. Um, we're seeing sustained concentrations with a slight uptick in main plant. And then we saw a huge uptick um, in East plant. Now it is possible that the uptick in East plant could be related to the number of cases at the hospital. Um, so that's something that we're monitoring as well. And then this is the graph that I think the mayor published. I just want everybody to note that, you know, over the Thanksgiving holiday, because of staffing, we were not doing a lot of sampling. And so this big jump is determined by these two points of having somewhat lower values prior to Thanksgiving. And then the sample that we took um, November 29th into November 30th, because we usually sample for a full day, um, came back extremely high. So this is the average concentration of the three plants. We uh, submitted some additional samples and we have results coming back tomorrow and also on Saturday. So it's going to be really interesting to see if this trend holds. If it had only been at one plant, I'd be a little bit more suspicious, but the fact that we saw higher levels at all three of the plants um, does lead me to believe that something's going on. Now, how it demonstrates or how it plays out in the, in the prevalence in the number of cases across the city, um, I think time will tell. So what does the city do with this data? Anytime we get data, we are sharing it with the Department of Health. They are the experts. They are the ones who can um, help us correlate it with what they're seeing in the case numbers and help us decide you know, if particular action should be taken. When we've seen, and I think hopefully you guys have seen this, when we've seen significant trend changes, trend increases in particular, we have shared that result with the public. There's always a chance that we share data um, and that the data you know, is not confirmed on the other side and that we end up with lower, lower um, concentrations. But we feel like it is a good opportunity to kind of give people empirical evidence of things that you know, we're, look, again, looking at imperfect data sets, we're looking at the, the number of cases that have been confirmed as positive, but that doesn't mean everybody who has COVID has actually gone and gotten a test. Um, and when and where possible, we focus on increased testing opportunities and in the press release that the mayor sent out today, uh, you know, there are a number of additional testing opportunities, 405 Pine Street, where there's free tests every day from noon to 8 p.m. And there's some other testing opportunities coming up at North Winooski, and then UVM is continuing to test um, their students and staff. And with that, I can take any questions. Yeah, so I think what we're going to do, Megan, um, thanks for all that information. That is really, really interesting. What I'd like to do is actually uh, hold your questions till the end uh, to make sure that we hear from Kelly and Tracy next. And then um, just because of our time, I'd like to um, actually ask folks to ask, wait until the end to have their questions asked and answered. So um, is Kelly with us? I have to pull my screen. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Kelly. Great. I I don't know why my camera's not working, but, um, oh, I see. I haven't turned it on, that's why. Okay, here I am. Thanks Hi. for having me tonight um, and giving yes. me the opportunity to, to talk with you about contact tracing. Um, I just wanna be clear though, I'm not an expert <laughs> on contact tracing. Um, I have been doing it since March, the end of March, when we were trained, um, we were kind of pulled from our regular duties and trained up to help out on the effort. And I've been doing it since then. Um, there are a lot of other folks that have been doing a, this type of work a lot longer. Um, and we rely obviously on our experts. Um, but I thought I would share um, my screen as well, have a few slides to go through, kind of keep me on track, but also make sure that I give you you all the, the information, the most accurate information we have. Um, so let me see if I can do that.
So can you see my screen now? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, this is just really an overview, um, again, to keep me on track and, and to make sure that I am um, giving you all the, the fundamental information. So um, case investigation and contact tracing is really a core disease control measure. Um, it's been employed by health departments for, for decades. And, and you know, now it's a key strategy for preventing further spread of COVID. But um, as Megan mentioned, there's lots of strategies and this is just one of many that we um, are implementing. Uh, so when someone refers to contact tracing, sometimes they mean both case investigation and contact tracing, which um, again, uh, involve working with the patient who has been diagnosed with, with COVID and then identifying those people that may have been in contact with that, that patient. And the goal obviously is to reach the contacts before they can transmit the virus to other people. So I'm gonna start off with just what um, case investigation looks like. So a typical interview starts when we find out someone has tested positive for COVID. And we start the interview by gathering um, information about whether they had symptoms or not and when they started. So what, what type of symptoms did they have? Um, we have a checklist of symptoms we ask them to go through. Um, and you know, having the day, the date at which symptoms started is really key. And we can talk about that why. Um, we also want to find out where the patient may have contracted the virus. So um, we are really interested if it's not clear, if they're not, if they say they're not quite sure where they may have contracted the virus, it's really key for us to go back 14 days um, prior to symptom development and find out what, what they were doing and who they were with and the types of activities to kind of assess the risk that they had. Um, and then obviously we wanna know about the people that they were with two days prior to their symptom development. So we, we refer to these people as close contacts. And a close contact is someone who was within six feet of the infected person for um, 15 minutes or more. And now that's a, a cumulative total of 15 minutes. It used to be when we first started doing this, we asked people to determine whether they were with somebody for 15 minutes and that was um, a concentrated period of time, but now it can be over the course of a 24 hour period. So we give, um, we give isolation guidance, obviously. I've linked here, I'm not gonna, I'm afraid if I go to it, it might not go back. So I'm sorry, <laughs> but, but I can make sure that um, I provide the documents are all on our website. The isolation guidance is, is clear that we want people, again, as I mentioned, we want to know when their symptoms developed. So we use that as their day zero. And so day zero, we want people to stay home and stay isolated from others for a minimum of 10 days from the first time they had onset of symptoms. So day zero, um, they have to meet three criteria to be released from their isolation. The three criteria are, one is a minimum of 10 days. The next is uh, 24 hours without a fever. And the third is their symptoms have improved. Um, so if they get to day 10 and they still feel sick, we ask that they stay home and stay isolated for a couple more days. So. It is a minimum of 10 days. Some people um, you know, get sick, they feel lousy for a couple of days, and by, by, 10, by day 10, they feel much better and they can be released as long as they have no fever and their symptoms are better. We also um, wanna make sure that people can isolate safely and correctly. So we always finish the interview by asking them if they have any needs associated with isolating. Um, do they have the cleaning supplies that they need? Um, do they have someone that they can ask to, to deliver food to them? Um, what, what do they need to be able to stay at home for those 10, at least 10 days? Um, and we have folks that will help make sure that they can isolate correctly, safely and correctly. 
Um, I included this graph just because it, I think it helps people think about um, when we're talking about the, the timeline for people that uh, have COVID. So obviously they're exposed to the virus and there's an incubation period. That incubation period varies from pe person to person. So it can be as short as two days before their symptoms start, or it can go as long as 14 days. So it can be 14 days incubating in the body before the first symptom um, comes up. The, then day zero is what we call the symptom development. So on day zero, um, we go back two days prior to that to talk about the infectious period. So the infectious period is obviously the time when they can spread it to other people. So that goes from two days prior to their symptoms through the 10 day isolation period. And again, this, you can see the isolation period down here is a minimum of 10 days. Um, and they can be released from isolation after their symptoms have improved and obviously no fever. Um, so that, that is a nice way to kind of look at it. So then once we've identified the, the close contacts that people have had, um, we call those people and we conduct a, sh a very short interview with them. We obviously notify that they've been exposed. Um, sometimes this mean, sometimes they already know that they've been exposed to somebody because that person has told them. So if, if a friend or a family member has been exposed to, has COVID, they, they typically do outreach to those people around them that they know that have been in contact with them. So the majority of time, this is not new, this is not a surprise to them. So they're notified of their exposure. We confirm the date. So we say, we understand the last time you were in contact with um, someone who had COVID is this date. Is that, um, if they know about the exposure, then they can confirm that date. We ask them if they have any symptoms and um, you know, that is important. If they have symptoms, we want them to get tested right away. If they don't have symptoms, we would ask, we ask that they can, they go into quarantine and they watch for symptom development. Um, the quarantine guidance is to uh, stay at home for 14 days and watch for symptoms. However, you can, if you don't have any symptoms at day seven, you can, get a test and stay in quarantine until the results come back. And if the results come back negative, then you can be released from your quarantine early. And then again, we finish the, um, the interview with offering support to be able to quarantine. Um, the timeline for close contacts. So you can see that they, it starts again with an exposure. Um, the exposure may, may or may not uh, uh, actually turn into COVID. So we want them to quarantine. And again, the reason we're asking them to quarantine for 14 days is because it can take up to 14 days for someone to have uh, symptoms. So the incubation period um, is again from two to 14 days. And then this day seven, they, they have the option of getting tested and then um, if they have no symptoms or they test negative, um, they're released from their quarantine. Obviously some people are going to test positive. And so then, then we call them and they become a, a case or a patient. And we do, we go through the same um, interview process that we did with the, uh, the patient that first had COVID. Um, this is the last slide that I had, and it's a little complicated, and so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but it really, it kind of just walks through the process of um, contact tracing. Starts obviously with a positive result. And then, as I mentioned, we reach out to find out who the person was with. Um, the I think the most important thing that I wanted to mention about this slide was that not everybody that has been in contact with a person is a close contact. And it's really up to the contact tracers to, to do the interview in such a way that we can determine whether the people that 
um, the infected person was with are considered close contacts. Same with um, a workplace, a school, um, a restaurant, a bar. Uh, we have we actually have a team of people that we can refer um, to, to to offer the guidance about whether um, a location that the person infected person was at is needs to be notified and needs to um, to to have an assessment about the risks that was associated with that with that um, that facility. So, I mean, those are the two things that I wanted to make sure people understand is that um, not everybody that comes in contact with the person is considered a, a close contact and not every place the person went to is considered um, a risk, a risk to the public. So with that, um, also we have a lot of information on our website related to COVID. We have a lot of data. Um, a lot of graphs. Uh, I encourage you all to go there and look for more information if you're curious. We also have a COVID line that where you can ask questions about quarantine, travel, um, the the governor's um, executive orders, all that. So people, we have that um, that call center available Monday through Friday. And I think now it's on the weekends as well. But I would encourage you to check out our website first. Okay, Kelly, great. Thank you very much for that information. We get to know how it works on the inside. Um, hopefully none of us have been through any of your processes here. Uh, unfortunately, Tracy Dolan, who's the Depu Deputy Commissioner of Health has not joined the meeting. And I've been trying to uh, get in touch with her unsuccessfully. So what I'd like to do for the remainder of our time is, um, open it up to questions and uh, also Megan, give you a chance to say more if there's um, something you'd like to, you know, a thought you'd like to complete. But um, otherwise, if folks have questions about, uh, you know, wastewater detection <laughs> or contact tracing, please let us know. Yeah, we got Matt and we got Mary. Oh, I get to go first, sorry, Mary. <laughs> Megan, can I ask, um, thank you for all that information. I was really, I was hoping you're gonna have all that detail. It's really, really interesting. So are you, based on what the uh, results are here most recently, will you now do uh, like more targeted um, sampling from certain certain streets and things like that? Or is it still too, is it still too diverse or diffuse to really be able to start that? Yeah, so we, um, with the uptick that we had seen in November, we have been doing regular sub sewer shed samples, um, which is why I know that the old North End, sort of the northern leg of the main wastewater treatment plant, we have seen some high numbers there. And while that trend does show us that there is possibly a prevalence of the cases, I'm a little cautious because I do know that it's all residential. Whereas comparing it to the other sewer sheds, the one that serves downtown or the South End, it, its concentrations are gonna be more diluted than the Old North End. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing that testing regularly. The testing, the results that come back tomorrow are uh, samples that were taken from the three plants, so sort of aggregated samples. And then the results on Saturday will be um, all three plants plus the sub sewer shed. So we might get that level of granularity. Um, you know, I think it has helped us it, in our in our um, sort of GIS tool. We do have the locations of long-term care facilities, and I know that's not really something I get into, but I know on the calls that I've been in um, and sharing the data with VDH, we are often looking at whether or not there are those long-term care facilities because those are obviously some ones that we're, you know, particularly particularly concerned about. And if we can give them any heads up to you know, if this is the week to do more testing, go ahead and do it, If depending on what their testing programs are. Yeah, let me just ask one more. It, the time gap, is it about a week or two weeks? I was trying to remember uh, if it's, um, uh, I meant to look this up. I think for, um, we can detect things. Let me actually go look look it up and I will get back to you just yeah, now. Cause I, I, remember, I remember us talking about that earlier on. 
Um, but there's that window on my on my presentation where people are shedding the virus but are not showing symptoms. Right. Um, it's like a, I think the first five days once they've been actually exposed. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. The New York Times said seven to eight days, I believe. Okay. They also correlated lower viral detection with affluent neighborhoods. Which mm. I thought was interesting, yeah. Except in India. In India, the poorest neighborhoods have the lowest incidence of COVID. And they think that because they've been exposed to so many viruses through their life that they have a higher immunity. I digress, but that was it. I read that today as well. Well, that's some of the thinking that I, I was just talking with our kid that was pediatrician about why kids aren't getting it. It's because kids have more recently been exposed to and gotten other types of coronaviruses. And that's one theory. Yes. I've yeah. heard theories about developing countries like South Africa, where they regularly get uh, shots that are preventatives for tuberculosis and whether or not, you know, that is, is conferring some sort of immunity. It's just, it's so interesting, you know, um, obviously wastewater has been around forever, but anytime we have this sort of new science, I mean, the, the amount of learning that's happened even in the six months on this wastewater based, based epidemiology has been phenomenal. Like what we knew in July versus what we know now is, is pretty cool. So Megan, I have a question. So the, the current testing that shows the high increase in the wastewater, including um, the hospital. So would that, that would include UVM as well? Because would that, I, I know that generally the UVM students did not have COVID. So having the absence of all those students, would that influence the test? N not having a lot more of positive, but having the absence of a lot of negative results. You know what I'm saying? So. So there would be more in the virus, less to dilute it by all the non-positive college students. Um, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. If, yes, so if uh, overall the, the wastewater flows, the amount of water that is being used, you could have the same load of, 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 of virus RNA, so the same amount of virus RNA. And yes, if there's less water, then your concentration could go up. I had not thought of that. I have not looked currently at our water metering results to see how much their flows have dropped with right, the students going home. To, yep. right. But that, that is one good explanation for sure. I think it's hard because like overall, we had, we had not seen huge numbers in East Plants watershed, even when there were cases at the hospital um, and there hasn't been a good way. We'd have to do a lot more um, manhole sampling like above the hospital and below the hospital and try mm -hmm. to isolate it to figure out if it's somewhere else in the neighborhoods downstream of the hospital because the hospital's at the top. If the hospital were lower down the watershed, we could isolate it better, but it's not, not the best setup. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Can, I, can I ask a quick question of Kelly? Kelly, are you seeing a lot of um, results, of positive um, results of people who had no idea that they were positive? A lot of, no, I'm sorry, a lot of asymptomatic people this time versus say, when you started doing the contact tracing or has that remained the same? Um, it's that's a really good question, and I don't know that I have a good, clear answer. Um, it's there are people that are asymptomatic, but it's not as many as I. I would say that it's not as many as there seemed to be in the beginning, um, but I don't know that that's true. <laughs> I, you know, it might be just my experience, and it, it's hard because it's, there's a volume issue. <laughs> like it's just. Right now, there's so many people that um, that we we're interviewing that it's all kind of blended together into one big Come jumble. Please. So I, I know that the data we have a data team that are keeping track of that, and I can find out. That's just it's also fascinating to me. I could give you all ten thousand questions, but it's just <laughs> it's so fascinating the tracing it and looking at the wastewater and. Well, it's like I'd attend a seminar if you guys held one all day. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's that cool. I don't know if anybody saw the article or the cartoon about the Swiss cheese and how Swiss cheese, you know, every piece of cheese has holes. But if you layer all of the cheeses together, all of the holes yep. are covered. And so mask wearing, social distancing, testing, yep. all that stuff has to be done at the same time. Because we pretty much have to just throw everything at this this thing to hopefully, you know, get to the other side. Um, and wastewater is one piece of that, contact tracing is one piece of that. It's, 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 
yeah. I mean, I would have liked to have skipped this part of my life, I guess. If I <laughs> let this happen some other time. But um, when you step back scientifically, it is pretty cool. Yeah. So Megan, when you've spoken with us before, you've really focused on in infrastructure and um, new projects and the new sewer pipes and all that kind of thing. This direction you're now in the epidemiological direction, is that uh, atypical for your job or have you traced other um, viruses or like you talked about drugs that we see, like how much of this has been your job in the past and relative to now? Um, I mean, we, we actually have been doing a lot of different types of sampling, like water quality sampling, more for uh, con uh, other contaminants um, like, uh, like BOD and whatnot, trying to understand the strength of the wastewater and if people are discharging things that they shouldn't be discharging. So a lot of my professional life and even like my master's degree was on water quality sampling. So that part of the science certainly has kicked in on this. Um, we, we have partnered with the wastewater-based epidemiology on the, on the drug studies, um, but our staff itself has not necessarily been as, uh, played as large a role as they are now. Um, and, and we're just one piece of the puzzle, right? We're working with the COVID analytics team at the city. Uh, they're one piece of the puzzle, puzzle and kind of managing the data and being the go-between us and our, our vendor, uh, Goagua, and the data and BDH and all the other people who need to know. So um, yes, it's a little challenging, like, cause it's so cool, I could spend forever on it, but then I also need to run the rest of the organization at the same time. So there's a little, little bit of attention there sometimes. Yeah, I can imagine. And Kelly, this is not what you uh, usually do at the health department. No, <laughs> it's, not, it's not, so. Everybody's changed in some way for this whole thing. Yeah, definitely. So do we have any more questions? Um, we have folks looking for Tracy Dolan, but we don't have any sightings or no, uh, no detection yet. Um, so we have some unexpected extra time and... I, I have another question. If, if anyone else does not, I <laughs> have worry. 500 questions. <laughs> um, so, Kelly, do you know if this is true? This is a theory. I, I don't know if this is true. So, uh, the, say the short incubation period versus the longer incubation period. Do you find that um, elderly people or, or, or people who have compromised immune systems are more likely to have a short incubation and the, the young, healthy people would have the longer incubation? Or is that not true at all? Or have you even, are you aware? Yeah, that's fascinating. I haven't actually heard that, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But um, it's these are good questions. We have, you know, a, a group of data folks that put together different reports based on our data, and um, if we know exposure, yeah, we could, we could definitely look at that. So, but I don't know. And, and are the current um, numbers, are they spread throughout the state as well? Um, you know, yesterday's, I don't know, but it was like definitely the largest uh, with 178 um, cases. Um, and I know, yeah, I'm not sure the distribution of that, but it's they, it does seem to be distributed, distributed um, more widely than it was for a while there. And I did, I did find this, uh, at least a scientific briefing about the advance notice. And so generally they think that the wastewater-based epidemiology, the sewer uh, levels would give you four to seven day advance notice um, uh, ahead of, con of, of confirmed COVID cases. And, you know, some of that is probably people getting tested and it takes two days to get back and all of that. But, you know, it's not a lot of time, but if, for instance, the press release that we put out tonight about the uptick helps people make a different decision about that gathering that they were gonna have, because we know people are still making those mistakes, um, or maybe they only invite two people over instead of five. <laughs> um, that, that's the information we're trying to provide. Megan, read, do you know? Oh, sorry. sorry. I was gonna say, I read UC San Diego has been uh, testing the wastewater as well, and each dorm is on a different system, I guess, so they can use that information to 
um, if there's an uptick to increase testing for a specific dorm and um, yep there's examples of you know testing specifically for um, long term care facilities large long term care facilities or uh, jails correctional facilities right because you're not necessarily going to unfortunately spend the money to be constantly testing the population but you could use it and again when you see it stay flat no prevalence no prevalence no prevalence and then it goes like this it lets you know you got to get in there and, and act quick that mary that was close to the question i had which is um is st mike's champlain uvm are they doing hyper local testing like of individual dorms yeah, I don't know what the status is of that. It's a little bit above my pay grade. You know, we certainly that was one of the concepts that we had um, and partnering with them. The the testing is fairly expensive and our staff don't have the capacity to be um, sampling additional manholes. Um, but that those conversations have have happened and, you know, things could change in the future, I think. Um, the only other city in Vermont that I'm aware of that is potentially doing this testing or thinking about doing this testing, uh, we heard uh, is Rutland. Rutland is considering, uh, they had done a pilot program earlier on, uh, similar to what we did and are thinking about bringing it back, which is good. Um, it doesn't work for every community. I was thinking about, does it have a, a role to play in managing some of the outbreaks in Washington County? But it only works if people are connected to a municipal sewer system. So if you're on a septic system, like many people are in Vermont, it's sampling the wastewater treatment plant and in a particular town is only going to get those people who are sort of in the municipal core. So, you know, it, it's imperfect, but it works really well in Burlington. Maybe you addressed this while I was trying to reach our other presenter, but I was thinking about people who come to a, a, a particular part of the city during the day, but then they leave and they may go, you know, 15 miles away uh, in the evening. And so we can detect the virus where they were, but that if doesn't- they, If work. they pooped at work. If and they then pooped the question... at work, but that doesn't tell you anything about where they may be. Correct, yeah. Right? So it, it um, we talk about sort of cultural norms. We even talk about like when, when are the time periods when people are likely to make a deposit or a contribution, um, you know, or even we talked about should we or could we be sampling specifically in the manholes that serve the schools. If Burlington High School had opened up, I had, we had identified the manhole that serves Burlington High School and that we were contemplating sampling then, but then it gets into the question, like I remember in high school, I didn't poop at high school, so we could have been doing all the sampling and it wouldn't have been telling us everything. So it really, you know, everybody poops, but not at the same time. And yeah, most people I think like to poop at home. So residential sampling is the best. That makes sense. I have a question. Does urine, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, does urine carry the virus or just poop? There's, I, I've seen one or two articles. It's primarily shed in the feces. Um, from from what I have read, so it's the poop that is the most important. Okay. Okay, uh, Carolyn, do you have a scatological question? For <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a question for Kelly actually, um, and this might not be something that you're tracking necessarily, but just kind of anecdotally, I'm curious how many uh, folks that you've contact traced or, or talked to who were positive have been really surprised that they were positive. Um, like say, you know, I, I have worn a mask every time I've gone in public, I haven't gone to any small gatherings. Um, just curious about kind of the breakdown of, of how many people are sort of shocked versus uh, saying, oh, you know, I, I shouldn't have gone to that party or, or whatever it is. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and obviously it's, I hope to answer anecdotally, but um, it recently, there's been a link to somebody or something. So it ha there hasn't been a lot of shocked people because um, right now there, it's really, recently it's been unusual to not know what the source of the uh, exposure was. Um, but not that long ago, a couple weeks ago, it wasn't, um, uncommon to talk with somebody and it's like, you know, I do everything I'm supposed to do. And I don't, I have no idea how this happened. So mm. it, it's, it, it's, you know, it's not surprising now with the increasing cases, it's a lot of families, it's a lot of, um, you know, one person 
friend, you know, friend groups or families, and then it just, it's, yeah, so. Thank you. And thanks to both of you for being here. This has been super interesting. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, on my presentation, I can send the link um, in the chat box. Uh, the city does have a whole page on its wastewater monitoring, and we have at least a simplified data set there so that you can kind of keep eyes on that. Um, if you haven't heard me actual press releases, it's probably because things are kind of settling down and, and uh, somewhat of a plateau. But that way you can check in tomorrow if you don't hear anything um, and see what the data show. Great, thanks. Um, any more questions before we wrap up for the evening? Any comments? Um, I will say that um, Ben Truman has been looking for Tracy Dolan, our missing presenter, and I told him we were actually doing okay. We're talking a lot about poop, and uh, <laughs> his response was, you really need to get out more. So, <laughs> Anyway, um, we may have uh, Ben Truman from the health department or Tracy come back in February, which is our next scheduled NPA meeting, and they may circle back and give us an update at that time. And uh, Megan, always, always interesting to hear from you. Um, we just want to keep you here forever. And Kelly, <laughs> I'm so glad that you joined us. And uh, let us know about the important work that you're doing. And uh, I know my neighbor is also a health department um, dietitian who's now been uh, conscripted into contact tracing. So thank you for your service. I know it's not the work you were hired to do, but it's had such a important role to play in our getting through this pandemic. Um, okay, so if we've got no more comments or questions, I would like to thank all our presenters and um, I do want to give a shout out to Sandy Yusin for participating this evening. Hi, good to see you. I know you're not uh, presenting this evening, but I'm glad you're here. Nice, nice to see you all. Thanks, thanks for the uh, great agenda tonight. You're welcome. Okay, all you friendly faces, thanks for joining us. We're happy to see you and our next meeting, like I said, is in February and we will be uh, addressing the upcoming local elections. We have a mayoral mm -hmm. race and we have city council, a city council race coming up. Save, save a little slot for uh, water resources. We want to come back. Our, our rate study um, and affordability program got put on hold because of COVID and because we couldn't do outreach, but we're trying to reboot it. So our tinkering of the rate structure um, and the uh, providing affordability program so that income burdened folks don't can still have access to clean, safe water. Um, we were going to try to come to you in January, but this is good information that we won't be able to come until February. But if you can carve out a little slot for us to reboot, that would be very, very helpful. Okay, that might be a good little pressure reliever in the middle of the candidate forums. Yes, free water. For, I'm just kidding, not free water, but you know, Residential, residentially appropriate cost and uh, priced water um, and making sure that people who can't afford water still have access to it. Great. Well, we look forward to seeing you in a couple months, everyone, and have a good, safe, healthy holiday season. And we'll be back. You'll hear from us uh, before long with our agenda for February.